uh, Dr. Daniel Bronner. He's an associate professor of medicine at the Pritzker, specializing in rheumatology and in geriatric and pa palliative medicine. He's an associate director at the McLean uh, Center for Medical Ethics and the director of the Geriatrics Fellowship Program. His research interests include cognitive impairment, dementia, language and medicine, and the history of resuscitation, cardiac arrest, and DNR. Are you telling me to stop? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's conducted research um, evaluating decision-making capacity in patients with dementia and the effect of dementia on the care of non-dementia illnesses. Today he's going to give a talk entitled Miracles and Default Design, American Medicine in Crisis and Beyond. Please join me in welcoming our final speaker, Dr. Daniel Bronner. Thank you very much. What? Yeah. That's okay. the right time. I added one more word, microaggressions, which is really what I'm going to be talking about. But first I'm going to hit on some of the, uh, some of the usual tropes that I've talked about in this conference and other places before um, and sort of tie it into this sort of new interest of mine or a side interest. So as, as I've said before, key, the key ethical issues um, in American medicine as I see it and others as well is one, the high costs, to the, um, the lack of access to good medical care, health disparities which, which highlight the problems, um, moral and uh, economic, and the fourth, which people don't think about as much, and I think which medical ethics um, really um, was established to, to deal with was the onslaught of medical procedures that are performed on patients without sufficient attention to their expected effectiveness. This has also been uh, called the technological imperative, and this is something that people have recognized since the uh, early 80s um, when Howard Spiro, a, a pioneer in um, uh, medical, uh, uh, the medical um, humanities movement, encapsulated the force which he saw driving the increasing application of technology in medicine um, at a conference entitled the technological imperative. And he said, and I quote, we are all encouraged to do more in the way of technological activities today than 10 or 30 years ago simply because third party payers pay for technology and not for thinking. When you talk with the officials, they point out that it is easy to assess, it should be there, not ask, the procedures, but difficult to assess the cost of a thought. Um, and that's been, I think, one of the basic problems in medicine today. Um, and this problem actually goes way back. Um, Hippocrates, you know, known for um, his sort of the beginnings of medical ethics as we know it now, um, was, also, was also working in the, a similar system, though not quite the same, but he also worked under the precepts of the fee-for-service model, which he, it's not that usually attributed to him, but here you, you can read this here. Um, I'm not gonna read it for you, but what he talks about here is how um, one should go about um, getting paid by uh, a patient, and it's probably not a good idea to talk to the patient when they're really sick or perhaps dying, but you should wait until they uh, get better and then you can extort money from them. Um, so, so the fee-for-service model has been with us for a long time. Um, but, um, and this is one of, uh, one of my recurrent themes here, I think the, the natural experiment that happened in the, um, in the mid-60s with the um, with the onset of uh, the passing of Medicare, and in 1966, the, the beginning of Medicare to, uh, to, uh, to pay uh, for medical care, we see the experiment in which the AMA sort of um, grafted the fee-for-service model onto um, government-sponsored medicine. And I see this as sort of the ultimate um, sort of um, evolution of the fee-for-service model um, in what we uh, see today in medicine. And they created what is known as a current uh, procedural terminology. This is the first edition. It was a pretty thin uh, volume in 1966. And this is where um, we see, first see um, the visit as a procedure, and you see the various levels of visits. And this is something I'll get back to. But here we see um, the uh, initial visit routine going all the way up to a very complete uh, visit with different relative value units or fees being charged for those. Another uh, important um, uh, consequence of the of the CPT codes, um, I think, 
that has um, not been really appreciated um, is the way um, specialty was transformed um, by, by the CPT codes. Um, because what they did was they codified the notion of consultation. Prior to, prior to um, the institution of CPT codes um, in the 60s, mid 60s, specialists were still taking care of whole patients. You would take care of patients who were um, had your disease, like a cardiologist would, would be the, the, the wasn't called primary, but they would be the physician for a patient with heart disease. This changed drastically um, in the 60s and 70s with this notion of consultation, which was a higher fee, um, um, which was encouraged, uh, which was noted, uh, developed its own CPT code. And you see here the last line, when the consulting physician assumes responsibility for the continuing care of the patient, any subsequent services rendered by him is no longer, and it is him, it's, right, is no longer considered a consultation. Um, and so you see here that there was a, a, a big incentive um, for specialists not to take care of the rest of the patient. And, and in fact, um, you see the nature of specialty changing a lot after the institution of CPT codes. Um, and of course, as I've, I've said in, on several occasions, with, with the second edition of CPT in 1970, now uh, a much larger um, uh, volume, 70% larger, we see the, um, the listing of CPR, um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation for cardiac arrest, as a billable, uh, as a billable procedure. And if I, as I've said before in this forum, this is the moment when CPR becomes the default for all uh, deaths in hospitals in the U.S. Um, in a with commencement, uh, commencing with, with uh, CPT codes, we see the birth of the um, in, uh, medical industrial complex, with, which Relman noted in 1980, 10 years after the second CPT code, in which you see the increasing uh, corporatization of medicine um, and the um, huge influx of money into uh, medical care. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the consequences of what happened as a result of this influx. And one of these, um, this is a Chicago Tribune talking about Chicago history today. Um, from uh, a few years after the heat wave, um, March 14th, 1999, you see the, the uh, headline on the front page here, U.S. sues UFC in medical, Medicare overbilling. So um, enlarging this a little bit. So in summary, um, what happened um, was um, they point out that UFC is a Midwest premier uh, medical research institution, um, that they've been fraudulently over billing or upcoding. And now this was not limited to the UFC. This was a, 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 you know, a movement. Um, University of Pennsylvania had just recently settled in, uh, a few years earlier for $30 million. Um, our case actually began in 96 with a sealed whistleblower compa uh, complaint. Um, and this was a, actually a campaign that began in earnest in, around 1994 after President Clinton's uh, health care reform plan failed. It, it, it's a response to the just incredible increase in the amount of money that was being um, put into medicine by the government. And they actually, this campaign netted billions of dollars. In fact, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois paid $144 million um, for their, uh, their uh, fraud. Um, and internal uh, Attorney General Janet Reno, as many people will remember, um, placed fighting health care fraud as her second highest priority next to prosecuting violent crime. So the government was very serious about this. And eventually, um, the UFC did, it got away with only uh, paying $10 million. Um, and in, in basically for upcoding from 91 to 97, um, and, and they settled, uh, as I said, for uh, 10 million. And with, with this settling, um, what we see is a real change. Um, people became very aware um, of this whole notion of fraud and how to uh, prevent it. And many of you may recognize this card. This is a billing card. Um, and it, um, it sort of directs you how to bill according to the note you write. You know, your level of history, exam, and DM is decision making and is a very complicated calculus um, that I've actually never mastered, I must say, but I, um, that, that people started really instituting in the, in the mid-90s um, 
after the mid nineties, after this, um, after this. Um, um, after these uh, fines were levied. And so you, you see here, this is for um, subsequent patient encounters. Um, and so what we see here is the medical record um, becomes a support for the level of CPT code billing. Um, this becomes sort of a very key imperative in, in caring for patients, especially in, in, in medical specialties which don't have uh, like actual procedures besides seeing the patient and taking care of them. And so the medical record becomes first and foremost a billing document uh, and proper documentation using the right words became uh, the means for avoiding what became known as fraud and, and people are talking a lot about fraud um, after these cases and fraud awareness training became a yearly mandatory activity and this is a little snippet from one of my emails I received about going to a fraud awareness training um, studying uh, how, how not to do fraud. And these are some of the, now they're actually the classes are online and this is one of the classes that I was forced to take. Um, just giving you the language of what you actually need to say in the chart in order not to be committing fraud. You see the one on the left is inadequate and the one on the right um, is, is the proper documentation and so that you would not be committing fraud. Um, and these are some of the other key documentation um, uh, advices um, about how to, how to write the medical, uh, how to document things so that you're, one is not committing fraud. So I think it's, um, there are a lot of unintended consequences of this sort of response to the skyrocketing costs of medical care. And um, first of all, it, it didn't work to decrease, um, to decrease the amount of money um, that uh, the government was spending. What happened was that people got much better at writing records that would, uh, that you could document care it's still at the highest level. And everybody's encouraged to still bill at the highest level, because why wouldn't you if you could? Um, what happened to the record itself, though, is that it becomes much harder to find the patient in the medical record because so much of the language has become generic in terms of uh, use for justifying billing. There's also an emphasis on pathology and risk, as was talked about yesterday. Um, the higher the risk of the patient, the, the easier it is to bill at a higher level. And so patients, um, it's very hard to find patients that are not high risk. And I would say it changed the dynamic between patients and doctors, uh, especially younger physicians um, in teaching into institutions who are actually charged with creating this documentation. Um, they write the notes and, and, and the attending physicians, you know, attest after that. Um, and as um, John LaPuma talked about burnout and prevention. You know, I think it's hard to find a physician these days who's not at least crispy around the edges, as I like to say, um, in terms of, you know, their response to all these pressures um, about what they have to write um, and the amount of documentation um, that does not seem, uh, you know, that helpful in actually taking care of patients. And I think in some cases what happens is that um, uh, the frustration um, of having to document these things is taken out on patients. And I like to frame these in terms of uh, microaggressions. Um, and um, the microaggression I'm going to talk about most today is um, one I see in charts all the time, doing geriatrics and consulting on older patients, um, and that is the poor historian. Um, so what, is, uh, what are microaggressions? Um, simply stated, microaggressions are derogatory slights or insults directed at a target person or persons who are members of an oppressed group. And here I, I'm making the case that in some case, that patients um, in the hospital can be looked upon as a, an oppressed group. Um, so microaggressions communicate bias and can be delivered implicitly or explicitly. This, you know, 
So how do microaggressions manifest? Um, so just a little sort of taxonomy for you. You have the micro insult, which is more of a blatant verbal or nonverbal or environmental attack on a target group. That's you know more obvious. Micro insults is really what we're talking about. And so it's, these are unintentional behaviors or ver verbal comments that convey rudeness or demean a person's racial heritage, identity, gender identity, religion, their ability or sexual orientation and identity. And I, I think it's a patient's ability that is really being questioned in, by this one. Um, micro invalidation, just to round it out, is um, verbal comments or behaviors that exclude, negate, or dis dismiss the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of the target group. And this is the classic, um, you know, rejoinder that I'm colorblind. I don't, you know, there's there's no problem here. So um, the poor historian as a microaggression, um, people, um, and this has been studied just a, a little bit, um, but people labeled as poor historians are often older, may have communication difficulties due to deafness, speech disturbances, um, cognitive dysfunction, or uh, distraction, pain or emotional distress. But I would say that other groups as well are, are often characterized, and somebody should do some empirical work about this, but I'm not gonna do it. Um, so I think the poor uh, are, are definitely uh, often, if, if you look at who gets listed as a, as a, um, as a poor historian, they're often poor, there are some often minority groups, or just, just, just the disenfranchised in general. And in addition, um, the problem with the term bad historian or poor historian is that the patient is not really the historian in the first place, right? The, the doctor or the, the healthcare provider, the person who is eliciting what happened and writing it down is a historian. The patient is the source, right? And so calling the, the patient a poor historian is actually wrong besides being a microaggression. It's, off, often, it's also not the reality of the situation. So question like what are other microaggressions as I've been thinking about these days? I think the term drug abuser, especially when it's used in the first line of a history and physical, is, is, is a microaggression. It's a way of, of denigrating the patient and, and calling attention to them uh, in a negative way. Um, I think the whole, in certain aspects, when people talk about low health literacy, I think that can be seen as a microaggression. Basically what they're saying is they don't understand what I'm telling them. Um, as with poor historian, it puts the onus on the patient um, as the one who has the problem here. When actually it may be the person who's telling the person what's going on that may have the problem. Um, also the notion of the non-compliant patient, the patient who won't do what I tell them to do. Um, that's the other sort of, um, is, is, is opposed to the notion of, you know, what's going on here, why isn't the patient, you know, taking whatever I uh, told them to take, looking more deeply into these problems. And that's it. Thank you. You made it to the very end. Mark, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. All right. I, I want to thank everybody for attending and speakers and Monica for moderating this last uh, uh, session. Um, and thank you for coming to the 31st uh, annual McLean Conference. Um, I'm just thinking that the dates of next year will be November 13 and 14, but uh, that's still a little bit up in the air. 